Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Zaka. Uh, he's a pediatric cardiologist, uh, so all the questions that there were, uh, he will be answering all the burning questions. He is, had a tremendous interest in a lot of inherited cardiovascular diseases, especially uh, in the context of today, Marfan's, uh, LDS, Allardenlos. Uh, he, we worked closely together for years, uh, including not only aortic disease, but also hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I mean, he has worked closely with the Amish population down the street uh, in Middlefield and uh, to under help understanding that disease. He's a professor of pediatrics at the Case Western Reserve University, and he's done a lot of work all over the world, essentially. Uh, apparently, he's a self-described baker, so, and he en enjoys sharing a cookie or two with his patients, so perhaps that's down the line uh, based on his bio here. So I think he's gonna talk to us about the pediatric care in patients with Marfan. As one can imagine, you know, as a parent, there is nothing worse than the trying to unravel the issues related to what you are passing off to your kids other than your 401k. So I think uh, Dr. Zaka. I actually like the line about the 401k. Because the whole issue of this being a genetic disease is really going to be key to how do we counsel adolescents and young adults. Yes. Thanks, Melinda. All right. I, uh, I show this picture of Ashley and Natalia with their permission, or at least with Ashley's permission, uh, to, to illustrate how pediatric Marfan syndrome can be the most challenging part of connective tissue disease. Um, and it can also actually be a very routine and mundane part of connective tissue disease. And that is that uh, we take care of uh, children who have really pretty minimal findings in the uh, heart and sometimes even minimal findings in in skeletal system, but we also take care of young people like Natalia who uh, require um, repair of their valves, replacement of their aorta before age one. And so it's a, it's a very significant spectrum that we have to deal with. And what we'll be talking about today is how we approach that. Um, everyone knows the history of aortopathy. It goes back to Antoine Marfin in 1896. Some people think I knew him. I don't know him. <laughs> Um, I wasn't around back then. I, I did, uh, however, having come from Hopkins, know uh, Dr. McCusick and, um, and obviously uh, Reed Puritz and Hal Dietz. I actually knew Hal Dietz before he was famous. Um, this, this particular slide, I think, is actually one of the most important in this talk. And it's from Dr. McCusick's landmark article in 1955 where he described a relatively small group of patients with Marfan syndrome. A lot of them had had autopsies. And um, he, not knowing it, though, he actually had the first description of what I think is Lowy's Dietz syndrome. And um, it's somebody who was tall, who had a club foot, and uh, who had some deformities of the fingers, and a bifid uvula. And now you look back and say, oh, Victor, come on. This was Lois Dietz. How come you didn't know it? Um, and I, I actually believe not 50 years from now, but 20 years from now, and maybe 10 years from now, uh, people in this room, and maybe I'll be in Florida by then, but people in this room will be looking back and saying, boy, those people back in 2017 really didn't understand this disease. Look at all the things that we can do today. And that's, the, I think, one of the underlying principles of we're, we're all going to continuously do better. Um, the whole issue of aortopathy gets back to the related diseases, re related disorders. And, um, and, and this list is only a very partial list of what causes aortopathy in children. And um, I think currently now, um, in our practice, 
Only about 70% of the patients that we take care of with aortopathy and connective tissue disease actually have Marfan syndrome. The, uh, the, uh, the other groups have Lois Dietz, ACTA, and um, SMAD, and, and, um, um, uh, and all the other ones, and all the other ones that are yet to be defined as well. So how are children different? Uh, when you train in pediatrics, you're taught to say children are not just small adults. Well, that's true, but, but particularly how, how in Marfan syndrome and the related disorders are they different? And we're going to explore a little bit of the diagnosis, medical management, surgical management, uh, lifestyle choices, and uh, I'm going to touch on the transition to adulthood. Um, children get diagnosed many times because their parents are affected. Oh, by the way, we've also diagnosed adults uh, based on the, par on the children having been diagnosed. Um, we see a lot of children for tall stature or pectus, uh, somebody, occasionally for mitral valve prolapse. Um, sometimes they've been to the eye doctor and the eye doctor says, you know, you really ought to go see a Marfan specialist. Sometimes the pediatrician pick up on the long fingers and toes, and, and like increasingly now, it's the sports screening. You know, uh, September is a uh, busy month for me uh, because I do sports cardiology and this, and there's just a, a continuous group of people who all of a sudden need screening because they have a pectus or some scoliosis. Um, everyone knows um, that the scoliosis and the flat feet and the thumb sign and everything else um, and how useful the systemic findings are. Um, and the, again, criteria, but, but why is it harder in children? Well, because um, sometimes we diagnose things in utero. Hmm, physical exam's a little hard in utero. Uh, what about those infants? Uh, not all systemic findings are present in the first few years of life. I mean, doing, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you tried thumb signs on newborns. You, you know, pe newborns are pretty hypermobile. And, uh, you know, until you're standing up, um, flat feet really don't count. Um, and it can be hard to assess scoliosis in an infant. Um, and the other thing is that aortic dilatation and mitral valve prolapse, they evolve over time. They're not static, and so in an infant or a very small child, they may have neither aortic dilatation or mitral valve prolapse. Oh, by the way, you can have Marfan syndrome and be an adult and have a normal aortic size, too. So, and there's a lot of variability. And um, I only partially agree with Dr. Desai. Echoes are really pretty in kids, and, they're, and you can get good uh, reproducible data um, and MRIs and CTs are better, but in children they are a bigger deal because they either require sedation or radiation. And we're doing better with radiation, um, but we tend to use them less often than the adults do. Uh, the next thing is, and everybody's touched in on this thing called the Z score. It does not stand for zebra, it does not stand for Zaka. It's a, um, a statistical tool. Um, and this slide just illustrates how we approach what normal should be. Normal aortic size varies with body size um, and to some extent age. It doesn't terribly vary with uh, gender. And, it's, um, the, and there's a range of normal, much like height has a normal range, aortic size has a normal range. And I personally believe that your aortic size on the inside actually mimics your parents' aortic size. Right? Much like we look like our parents on the outside, well, we look like our parents on the inside as well. And um, we measure things differently in pediatrics. We uh, don't do leading edge to leading edge, and there's a long history of that. And we actually usually measure the size of the aorta when the valve is open. And with those measurements, we do this statistical modeling where if you are average, your z-score is zero. If you're below average, you have a negative z-score. If you're above average, you have a positive z-score. 
And um, one z-score is uh, the statistical tool called the standard deviation. And basically anybody between minus two and plus two for size, for your body size, is considered to be normal. Um, and if you're beyond that, um, you're, you are abnormal. Now, if I see somebody with um, um, connective tissue findings and their aortic z-score is plus 1.5, mm, yeah, I say, well, yeah, your aorta is normal, but you're well above average, and this probably does mean something as well. Um, the other thing that is different about children is that um, sometimes they have other things going on, and we've clearly seen a group of children who have congenital heart disease as well as their connective tissue disease, and I don't think it's actually a random accident. And we've seen Marfan patients with hypoplastic left heart meaning, yes, half of the heart did not form, um, with a hole between the pumping chambers, the VSD, narrowing, narrowing of the aorta, called coarctation. We've seen people with ventricular septal defect, the hole, and a blocked valve, pulmonary stenosis. And obviously, we've seen people with bicuspidic valve. There's also a variation uh, that's congenital, where the arm, where the artery to the right arm comes off abnormally, and uh, it has a big diverticulum as part of it, and uh, that's called a Comorel's diverticulum. That's important because you know that can also get big over time, and the same thing can be true of Lois Dietz, Acta II, SMAD, um, and the like. Um, Dr. Kalahasti did a beautiful job of reviewing all of the medical therapy. And my, my general take on this is that there have been now, in, um, by 2018, 20, almost 2018, lots of trials looking at um, blood pressure medicines, looking at beta blockers, and they've all been many, many different designs. And we are a little bit further ahead, and that is, and I think most of us quote the um, Pediatric Heart Network trial of over 600 uh, patients that looked at comparing a low sartan to a tenolol, and relatively young patients with um, uh, aortic dilatation. And they were assigned to uh, a tenolol and low sartan, and they were followed for only three years. The, the bottom line of this particular slide is, I think, one of the most important, and, and Dr. Kalahasti touched on this as well, and that is that the dose of atenolol was a really pretty good dose of atenolol, almost three milligrams per kilogram, which is kind of um, likely to cause you to be tired and fatigued. But the dose of losartan was actually pretty low, and, um, and so it may not have been a surprise that in the end, um, as he told you, that it, the losartan wasn't superior. In fact, it may have been um, a little bit inferior to the beta blocker. <clears throat> so um, how do we, at, so th those are the trials, but, but kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we approach this um, medical therapy of uh, the aorta in uh, children? And the first thing, and this is a little bit controversial, is that well, if you don't have aortic dilatation, um, or if you have minimal aortic dilatation, do you absolutely need um, medication as an emergency? Uh, and I think the answer to that is no. I really do like to get some baseline to have a sense of what is going to be the personal natural history of this patient. Um, and once I have that baseline, and if they have aortic dilatation, I then actually usually choose a beta blocker often natalol or atenolol, or an angiotensin uh, blocker, losartan, or much more recently, herbosartan, based on baseline heart rate and blood pressure. So there are lots of Marfan patients that are actually um, have a relatively slow heart rate, and I don't want to drop their heart rate further. There are lots of Marfan patients who have, wait a minute, relatively high heart rates, and we ought to get those down. 
and, uh, and so I try to pick the right drug by listening to the patient's heart rate and blood pressure about what they really need. And I'll adjust the dose based on aortic size trends, the weight and the heart rate and, and the kidney function. And uh, many years ago, because I trained with Reed Peretz, I too used to have people run up and down stairs, and it just got old, so uh, yeah. And yes, we combine beta blocker and Indian extension receptor blockers for uh, aggressive change in aortic size, and largely also for the inf infant onset of the disease. I do have some concern about the impact of angiotensin receptor blockers on left ventricular size and uh, wall thickness. Um, uh, Dr. Desai and I are in another trial where we're trying to use angiotensin receptor blockers to thin out the heart muscle. And since there's a very small proportion of Marfan patients that go on to transplant because of primary cardiomyopathy, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that, and I follow that very carefully. And, uh, and again, I, I actually tend to treat uh, Lowy's Dietz more aggressively than Marfan. All right, when is it time for surgery? So I know that uh, everybody's paying a lot of attention to the aorta, but uh, equally troublesome some, in some children is the mitral valve. And um, mitral valve prolapse with a lot of mitral regurgitation um, can sometimes uh, prompt us to do surgery even before the aorta needs to be done or, uh, or is an isolated uh, operation. And, and basically we look at how is the child growing, what's the heart size doing. But I think the best, the best tool is actually when the kids start having rhythm problems, then um, that usually means that the mitral valve is causing a trouble. So in terms of the uh, aorta, um, I, I think one of the most important things to know is the family history. Um, and so if, if there's people in the family who have had aortic dissection at a small size, that is, as they say in Boston, a wicked red flag. And, um, and if you look back, that's probably the Lowy's Dietz um, or the, the, the other, some of the other um, mutations. And so we're much more careful about family history of small aortic size and in the Lowy's Dietz patients and sometimes the Octa-2 patients. Um, I am totally intolerant of uh, rapid aortic growth. And, and by that, I mean anytime somebody's rate of change changes so that if you were going up, and yeah, you're going up despite our treatment. When you start doing this, that is a very bad sign of impending problem. Um, I, I uh, do like the uh, aorta cross-sectional to height ratio greater than 10. The reason I like, and you notice this, there's no z-score on here. Uh, the reason I like this is because a lot of the Marfan patients uh, are so slender um, that their z-scores, uh, because the z-score is based on body surface area, they tend to be quite high. And so uh, I just said, all right, uh, uh, so first of all, I don't see many, I, don't, I think I've seen like one pediatric dissection in my entire career. I can remember it like it was yesterday, and it was when I was at Hopkins 20, 30 years ago. So it's, the, the, the risk of aortic dissection in children is quite low. And, but um, the other thing we'll keep an eye out for is the amount of aortic regurgitation. We virtually do entirely valve sparing operations and when you start developing aortic regurgitation, it's because the valve is getting splayed out and I want to keep that valve he um, healthy. Um, the last um, is that if we're going to put in a, a graft, the aortic valve ought to be near adult size. You don't, because the graft fixes everything at the current size. So you don't want to have a situation where you did the surgery at age four and you had to put in a graft that wasn't going to allow that valve to grow. And so we tend, and, and the valves tend to be adult size by usually eight or nine. And so we kind of, if, especially for the Lowy's Dietz kids, that, that turns out to be a particular time. 
And uh, for, for uh, Natalia, who needed her surgery when she was uh, under one year of age, we tend not to do an operation that constricts the val um, valve growth. Uh, all right, what have we learned fr since from Flo Hyman to Isaiah Austin? And I'll be honest, I, I wish, I don't know we've learned as much as we need to. Um, these are my key questions. Does exercise cause aortic dissection? Does exercise cause more rapid progression in aortic dilatation? Is the type of exercise important, competitive versus recreational? Um, could exercise benefit aortopathy patient? And does it matter what you look like or, or what your gene is with regard to exercise? Um, I think that aortic dissection has been temporally associated with sports activity in athlete sudden death registries. So in every athlete sudden death registry, there are a very small number of people who have aortic dissection. And it's also true that athletes have bigger aortas. Um, and there's no doubt that weight training increases your blood pressure transiently. But also, physical activity tends to improve cardiovascular health. And various guidelines try to address these things. This is the chart from the American Heart Association, and this is the chart from the Marfan Foundation that begins to look at, well, well what should we do here? And, um, and at the bottom, there's the non-contact, non-strenuous sports, golf, bowling, walking, and then above that aerobic dancing, um, badminton, bicycling, leisurely, jogging, swimming, uh, table tennis, etc. And the further you go up on this list, the more it is that you're pushing your body and you're pushing your heart rate and blood pressure. So this is the story about the weightlifting. This is Vasily Alexev, and this study's been done. His, his blood pressure was likely in the 400 range. And, uh, and so that's obviously not good. So as, I, and I'm not gonna duplicate because I usually do what Sager did and go, uh, no, yeah. Yeah, basically you should be able to uh, uh, always breathe while you're lifting things. And so people say to me, Dr. Zaka, how many pounds? Well, you know, like it depends on your body, right? You can't pick a, an individual pound. When, when you're 20 years old, 25 pounds on each hand seems like nothing. When you're 65, it's not the same, okay? All right. Um, the Heart Association uh, guidelines are fairly specific. If you have no uh, aortic dilatation and, and nothing else going on, uh, you can do uh, some moderate static sports um, or uh, no collision sports. But if you have any aortic dilatation, um, you're restricted from all sports. And, uh, and the same thing is with Lowy's Dietz. I think probably with Lowy's Dietz, it's probably uh, even without aortic dilatation, your risk is probably higher. Um, so now we have to fuss with, well, how about those recreational sports? And, um, and on the left-hand um, side is the old bowling. And um, so, um, so we just said, you know, it's okay to do a few pounds. Well, it's, last time I checked, bowling balls were available in 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 pound balls. And so I spent some of my time negotiating what, what weight bowling ball can we do? And, and uh, so in the guidelines, it always says you can do three or four pound weights. <laughs> well, like how is a bowling ball a three pound weight, right? Um, yeah, and uh, I actually personally think that volleyball is, is actually pretty good and golf is pretty good. All right, H how many of you in this room have been told whether or not you can go on roller coasters. Yeah. Every single time I go to the doctor, I ask. Yeah. And uh, so what is the data that says that roller coasters are bad? You think anybody from the uh, neuroimaging center goes on roller coasters? I don't think so, <laughs> right? So uh, 
Subdural hematomas are reported in patients on and off Coumadin, um, but this is the, this is the catcher here. Um, vertebral artery dissection, you know, the ones that run up the back here, are reported in patients with normal aortic tissue. And from my understanding, here in Northeast Ohio, probably every summer there's three, four, five, six people that come from Cedar Point with vertebral artery dissection. Um, and uh, I have done heart rate monitoring on patients on um, roller coasters. It does increase. Um, and so I tell people, I, don't, I just don't think they're a good idea. And, you know, I don't mind the gentle roller coasters. Um, s some of the kids drive like they're on a gentle roller coaster. <laughs> um, and I would also say to you, and, and this is what I learned from the trauma surgeons, listen, auto accidents are not a great idea, <laughs> right? And, and I had this discussion with uh, Reed Peretz once about how we could do um, airbags for, um, you know, do we get dolichocephalic crash dummies and see if the airbags are too bad or too good for them? I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Then there's the issue of individual autonomy. I just, I, I pulled these off the internet. Um, in high school, I was never allowed to play sports because of Marfan, but I did everything else I shouldn't have. Three on three tournaments, the biggest roller coasters, even bungee, bungee jumping. By the summer after my high school graduation, my aortic valve and root were shot, and I needed surgery. Well, the interesting thing is that it may have had nothing to do with all those activities. That just may have been what he was ready for. And this person with a bicuspidic valve basically said the same thing. But the last line is what I really like. You gotta keep living your life, right? So practical approach. I think that age appropriate activity will change from early childhood to adolescence. And so, you know, I tell people soccer, swimming is all fine. And, but when you get to, uh, you know, late middle school and high school, you know, I'm just, uh, they'll kick me out of the Marfan, Lois Dietz, Aortopathy Church if I let you uh, do all this. Um, I have some more stories that I'll tell offline about that too. Um, and, uh, and then the next thing is you gotta listen to your body. Um, you can do some heart rate monitoring. If you're doing cardio type stuff, you ought to be able to carry on a bit of a conversation with somebody else in the room. Um, the other thing, adaptive gym. I, I filled out more gym stuff for schools. And basically I tell them uh, no contact sports, no competitive sports, no fitness testing. Can you please develop an adaptive gym program where they do skills and the like? Uh, please, please keep in mind, recreational sports can be very competitive. Bowling balls and golf balls can be very, golf bags can be very heavy. And aortic root surgery changes the risk of aortic dissection, but not the recommendations, in large part because of the rest of the aorta. Um, this is a pitch for a study we're doing in HCM called Live HCM. And it basically, you know, if you, if you want to commiserate in terms of restrictions, uh, the HCM population has the same restrictions. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out, well, what are people really doing and what is the real risk? And, and try to get more data about what, what may or may not be safe at any given uh, aortic size. Um, also, please remember that Marfan, Lois Dietz, et cetera, is not just a heart and vascular problem. There are lots of other stuff going on. And my personal feeling is that any of us in the connective tissue business should be familiar with all of this. Um, and um, because we each can have the ability to um, provide some uh, direction. Allergies, headaches, ADHD, coping. Um, uh, if I had my way, everybody would, with Marfan would see a psychologist without um, their choice, but, you know, because I think psychology is, a, is an important part of how we help people. GI, craniofacial, pectus, hernias, scoliosis, et cetera. Osteoporosis, please, in Northeast Ohio, and make sure you take your vitamin D. Um, I'm often asked about the cardiac issues for pectus and scoliosis repair. 
basically the body does, uh, we've not had any issues um, with people tolerating those. Um, scoliosis surgery um, with MRI compatible rods, um, not, um, <laughs> Even though things are MRI compatible, meaning you're not going to stick to the magnet, it doesn't actually mean that the MRIs will be of any value after it would. And so then we have to toggle over to CT scans. Um, ADH med, uh, this is like for all of my practice, I bet I, I answer um, is our ADHD meds okay uh, 10 times a week? But it clearly comes up for the Marfan and Lois D's patients in particular. Uh, virtually all stimulant medications increase the heart rate and blood pressure. Um, guanfacine uh, tends to lower the blood pressure. That's Intuniv. And Stratera, the amoxetine, um, um, tends to increase the blood pressure. And basically, if, if you need ADHD meds to get through school, then maybe we just have to adjust your other meds um, and keep an eye on your aorta. Transition to adulthood. It's a very hot topic in uh, pediatrics and in internal medicine. How do we get people with chronic disease to go from the world of pediatrics to the world of adulthood? Um, and uh, those of you who um, I take care of in the audience know that um, much uh, like Malin said, you really have to know your Marfan syndrome and you have to take ownership of it. And uh, it's not okay if I ask you, why do you come and see me, that the answer is, I don't know, or check my heart or whatever. Um, you must have a primary care doctor. I'm not a primary care doctor. Um, you must have cardiology follow-up. And, and I feel very strongly that if you transition from a pediatric provider to an adult provider, it should not be a general cardiologist. It should be a specialist. Uh, we talk about education, employment, insurance. We do occasionally talk about marriage. My favorite question is, uh, what are you going to tell your future spouse? And it's an open-ended question. And um, because my answer to that is, you're lucky to have me. You should not be defined by your Marfan syndrome. We all have stuff going on, baggage that we bring to marriage. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, don't define it as Marfan. Uh, it's sometimes awkward. We talk about contraception and pregnancy. And we talk about recurrence risk and I'll occasionally even delve into the opportunities for modifying recurrence risk. Why do I do this? Because, because I'm there and I have, I have the bully pulpit. Uh, lifestyle choices, uh, you know, teenagers are not great. Uh, Red Bull's not a great idea. I don't even know what five hour energy. I thought five, five hour energy was something that idiots drank until I saw one of the cardiac surgeons drinking a bottle of it. <laughs> He also drinks a lot of diet. <laughs> you know, ephedrine, you know, you'd be surprised what athletes and everybody take. The, uh, the lower uh, uh, left-hand corner, um, you know what? Teenagers try alcohol, et cetera. It, you know, alcohol is just not good for the heart rhythm. It's not good for the heart muscle. And obviously smoking, including weed, is not good for the aorta. Why are you laughing? <laughs> um, I, you know, the whole, I just want SBE prophylaxis to go away. Um, there's no doubt that valves that leak are more prone to infection. Um, the most important way of uh, preventing infection on the heart is to um, make sure you have good dental care. Um, tattoos are not a great idea. Uh, you know, why somebody chose to immortalize their heart uh, problem on their chest with that kind of tattoo, I'll never know. I have a whole collection of tattoos that have medical themes to them on my patients. Infected body piercings are not a great idea. And believe me, I can't believe tongue piercings are not a great idea. Um, and as everybody else has said, this is, this is really teamwork. Um, genetics and... Uh, uh, 
I couldn't do what I do without the superb uh, geneticists and genetic counselors that I work with. And we really, we meet um, twice a month to kind of go over all the cases and make sure that we um, have good uh, uh, thematic approach to uh, connective tissue disease. And you'll hear from uh, one of our superb uh, counselors, Christina, later on today. Uh, you need perfect imaging. Um, psychology is important. You'll hear from some of our physical therapists who have done great work with some of the younger kids and, and probably could benefit the older people. Cardiology, interventional cardiology. I think that Dr. Rosselli is also partly an interventional cardiologist. Um, ophthalmologists, cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, um, and general surgery all have to understand what, uh, what's going on. Thank you very much.